election. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, 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 I, and I can say as a former staffer, you do notice when you, your job is to check emails that morning, you have a hundred identical emails on a particular issue that mm. someone at least cares enough to fill out the form. And it, it's usually something that we brought up in the morning meeting with the senators. Like I've got a hundred emails on this issue and um, depending on who you work for, the senator might say like, well, tell them to fuck off. Uh, <laughs> or they might say something like, yeah, well, okay, well actually like I'll look into that and we'll send a form response. We'll draft up a response that everyone gets on that issue, which is, usually what, what happens if, if the issue's even remotely um, on point and relevant to the politician. So, yeah. Um, yeah, in a similar vein, just be a really active participant in democracy. Uh, vote minor if you have the option when it comes up. Um, so um, look into your options and send a message when you go to the polls. So I think, I'm not sure if who knows how many people tend to know that um, if a candidate in an, in an election gets 4% of the primary vote, that is the, the number one vote from 4% um, of the voters, then they get their $1,000 deposit back or $2,000 deposit for running in the Senate, and they also get about $2.70 per vote. Um, so I, I really hate that, that um, if you don't make that 4% threshold, you don't get your nomination deposit back, and they call it a deposit, so it feels like yeah. when you're renting, and you don't get your deposit back. It, make, it makes you feel like you've broken democracy. You've done something wrong. If you don't get one in 25 people to put a number one in the box next to your name. So when you're looking um, through your candidates, and they're always announced three weeks in advance for an election, uh, find the small party candidate that best aligns with your ideals and put them first and then put your preferred major party who's realistically going to get the vote second because it will flow to them anyway. And it sends a message. I'll, I'll second that. In fact, I'll, I'll add that the 4% uh, threshold was definitely voted into place by parties who never had to worry about being under the 4% threshold. <laughs> as, a, as a deliberate tactic to make sure that small parties do not receive this electoral funding. So. You've all probably heard of think locally, act lo uh, think globally, act locally. Um, I would flip that around and say act locally, participate in the, the political process, but always spend globally. That as much as there might be good things you can do in the political process in Australia, the impact your dollar has is never going to compare to donations overseas. I do identify with effective altruism, and I would say your money is, does not belong in the political system in Australia. Your actions will always have vastly more power. If you want to dedicate your career to it, I would definitely advocate for that. If your personal fit is with being in policy, in advocacy, in joining the public service, then that is a fantastic way to be able to do both, because if you, you know, get an established role in any of these domains, you'll be earning enough that you can comfortably give a reasonable amount of money to highly effective interventions overseas. So I don't personally view my role with the government as an effective altruist role. Um, I've had people immediately assume because of where I work and what I do that it is something I identify with that way. Mainly I see it as a source of income when it comes to effective altruism, though I do think there's a great deal of leverage that I'll be able to have through my role in the future. Um, so definitely, yeah, do participate in the political process. All of these things, particularly writing to your cluster ministers if there is something in a particular domain that you know reeks about the way we run the country. And generally, they're not that sexy, but if you and 30 mates can get a letter sent, if you can get on board with a campaign where a group of people are passionate about that issue, you can genuinely make a dent in the policy formation process and often take it out of the media and into the minister's office and subsequently into the department or ministry and from there on. Thank you. And now, thinking about those uh, career and what sort of people, if they did want to dedicate their career to political change, what sort of skills do you think are, are important to do your job or to do something similar to your job? Uh, and similarly, what sort of skills or traits would totally disqualify someone from doing what you do? Um, and is there another way that someone with that trait could contribute to the, the cause area you're talking about? You've got to be able to deal with frustration. I think in any of our roles, being able to just you know put aside the little hurdles and put aside the inefficiencies or the ridiculousness and just keep progressing with your you know stated goals, whatever you're trying to achieve. Um, in the public service, particularly if you want to be more on the policy side, you need to be uh, both flexible and strong-willed. Um, I'm currently in an operational management kind of role, so I steer clear of too much involvement in policy because I find it frustrating personally so I mean personal fit is a really huge thing and you need to understand how deep into the uh, the horse trading you're willing to get before it gets too much for you. Uh, yep so the um, the 
point about being able to deal with failure, yeah. I, I learned during my, sorry with disappointment, I learned during my PhD that I was uh, able to come back the next day and keep hitting my head against the same brick wall until the brick wall broke. Um, being able to talk to people about like, oh, I've never thought of myself as an extrovert. And then uh, the 2016 election came up and uh, going round the science party meeting room and deciding, okay, who's going to run as a candidate? And I put my hand up and yeah, sure, I'll do it, whatever. <laughs> and um, that was the weirdest thing I've ever done and I'm doing it again, so obviously I didn't mind it too much. Um, the conversations that you have with people are pretty weird and uh, you don't know until you get there if you're doing things the right way. Don't worry about doing things the right way, just if you think you should be giving a call to one of the other candidates to discuss something, just just do it. So I think, I guess that's a lack of worrying if you're doing the wrong thing, because no matter what you do, someone will think you're doing the wrong thing. Um, I don't know if that's a lack of self-consciousness or what, um, but yeah. You have to be prepared to not be universally liked, I guess. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, uh, those two things, you know, the, the frustration, the ability with failure, and to really put yourself out there, that's true for what I do as well. Uh, often it's knowing that you I mean, you have to put yourself out there. You have to really put your name to everything you say. You are in public eye, in a sense. And if you say something that is wrong, or you make a mistake, it could be there forever. It could be on a transcript somewhere, or it could be in a media story, even, you know, if you're unlucky. Uh, so I guess the willingness to put yourself out there and back yourself, because sometimes it can be quite intimidating knowing that you've got a machinery arguing the opposite side of the case that's well resourced and has a bunch of senior politicians behind it and, and you know you're still a kid in the scheme of things trying to get your point across um in in terms of what else i guess you can do um i mean you, there are tons of things you can do where you don't have to put your name to things you know if you phone up your mp or write them an email or something if you just have a meeting with them if you join your local community organizations or groups you're being a part of the change without just being, just having your name out there, this is my individual position, you know. So a anyone can get involved. Um, and that can be just as effective if we get enough people doing it. Thank you very much. And I'll add one thing to that, um, just so you're aware, we will be doing the last question soon, and then we'll be having closing arguments, a brief break for you to log your questions and do whatever else you need to do, and then we'll move on to Q&A and finish up the event. But I'll add something to that really quick. One trait that I think is very important that most political actors should have and they don't is open-mindedness. Um, and that's a willingness to talk to people you disagree with because unless your job is to be uh, a party uh, party hack, for lack of a better word, and fight for your team, regardless of whether they're right or wrong, for the entirety of your career, you're going to have to talk to people you disagree with at some point. And you have to talk to them in a way that doesn't put them offside immediately. So whether you're trying to change policy uh, as a uh, external actor or as a uh, political candidate or within the public service, I think you have to be willing to listen to someone you disagree with, understand their argument, and, and then uh, possibly even change your own mind, as shocking as that might be. So we'll move on to our final question now. Um, and this is the inspired by a quote, I believe, from, uh, from Yes Minister, Yes Prime Minister, about the politician's syllogism. And the politician's syllogism is this, is that uh, we must do something, this is something, so we must do it. Uh, and, and, and what my last question is about, how do we avoid being wrong in a way that creates negative outcomes? If we are wrong on policy issues, and since I suspect all of us do disagree on at least one issue, someone here is wrong about some of our political beliefs. It might even be me. Uh, and if that's the case, how do we avoid enacting policy that can actually have a negative outcome? What, what ways can we actually mitigate against that risk? Oh, that's, that's so hard, but at least the very least we can do when we go into policy discussions and debates is to go in, as you say, with an open mind and go in honestly. And there are endless reviews and inquiries on so many policies that um, just get cast aside. So some of them um, are held up as advancing a certain view and then therefore we must go ahead with this policy. But then there's just a line and the, the outcomes of other reviews are just brushed under the carpet, no media release, no nothing. So just going into it openly and honestly. Um, you don't know what you'll come up with, but at least we have to be honest about what we're trying to solve. Thank you very much. Uh, 
uh, read as widely as possible. Often you're pushing for a change that uh, has been tried in some way in other countries. That doesn't necessarily guarantee you know how it will play out, but it gives you some idea. Uh, and if you can make your argument with a frame of reference of this is, has been done before or this research has been done backing this up, then even if it doesn't work out, you can at least say, look, I had an honest and genuine belief. It was backed up by all of this. Uh, my heart was in the right place, but you know that's the way things work out. Sometimes you just don't get the results you want, like anything else. Um, and yeah, then you just uh, keep telling yourself that and you go to bed and you hope you can get eight hours of sleep. <laughs> Um, as, as I said previously, the devil's in the details. Even the worst piece of policy can sometimes be enacted in a way that mitigates the worst potential outcomes. So, I mean, that that's being on the operational side. If you can find a way to achieve the intended outcomes of the policy without falling prey to some of the minutiae that are just wrong about it, or on the flip side, achieve the minutiae that are right despite the overarching aims of the policy seeming wrong-headed given the, the domain experience of a lot of the people actually working in that industry. Um, there's, there's ways around these things, but ultimately participating in the political process, trying to ensure that when there are multiple reviews carried out on something, the line is not what prevails, but is just, you know, yet another line in the mix of opinions being given. Um, yeah. Kushik, I'll just add something quickly. Often if you are part of something end up being very bad and working out quite horribly, you're often the best person to help undo the mistake you made. Uh, so some of our, you know, most, uh, some of the people who follow us the most on our mailing list and who are our best members are former public servants who've firsthand seen, you know, a particular mistake happening, have been a part of that. And obviously they can't come out publicly, you know, I mean, they might be constrained depending on what their agreement was with their workplace. But, you know, they will often, communicate with us and you know tell us you know, give us tips about this or that I mean you know they're retired mostly so it's, I guess it's okay uh, and because they have this understanding of the issue they're able to contribute in a more meaningful manner so often you know you could be I mean you shouldn't give up or feel sad because you've been a part of a mistake because you can be part of the change you want to see happen I would also yeah not chalk too much of that up to government as a whole and the need to reduce taxes but also that learned helplessness. So on the policy side, trying to get people involved who will not be driving mistakes rather than